from all, to all, with all, for all, through all, we thank the gods of creation. We thank the ancestors. We thank the forces of nature. And we thank the earth. We thank them for their direction, their protection, their guidance, for keeping us, showing us, allowing us to know and enjoy life to its fullest, now and later. Black people who must love with the slow amounts of time, time was ours to hold in the soft, low born chambers of our hearts. And was we, the half-fooled mommies and daddies of a sun world, would turn our strands of hair into antennas to tune in the juju madness and syncopated love rhythms of Africa. And we loved with time, and we took the time to love, and with the right time we loved, and we loved time after time. Will we ever love? Love again? Will we ever love again? Will we really ever love again? Or will we just sit and rot away with the brighter tomorrows in the skag filled, rat cluttered the, 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 the halls of our minds? Black people, what y'all gonna do? Black people, what y'all gonna do? Will the real black people please stand up? And welcome once again to our story, the program that makes being black positive, relevant, desirable, and true to a lost nation in America. A program that speaks to the historical significance of the original people of the earth. Our story network takes pride in setting itself away from other programs that centers on entertainment or rhetorical mumbo jumbo that misdirects your attention onto other things that causes you to exhaust your resources and renders you brain dead. It is our story who talks about commitment to you and your people. It is our story that champions the reestablishment of the black genius that once ruled the world. It is our story that focuses you in on the rewards of black advocacy, black activism, black involvement, and black power. It is our story that encourages survival of the black race and solicits your involvement to that end. Black folks must remember, race first is the call of the day, and we as a people must, I say must, take the pledge if we, the people of the original race, expect to survive. As I take the many lessons I have received over the years and reflect upon them by sharing these lessons with my brothers and sisters, I realize the power that we as a people possess for the most part has gone unnoticed. The masses of black people who have been rendered lost and disenfranchised from the meaning and mission our creators intended for us to embrace is all but depleted. It is because of the mission and meaning of the life of our ancestors that I realized how blessed 
as black people we really are. What fascinates me are the many gifts I have been granted, which allows me to distribute the information onward to you. As always, that message begins and ends with the importance of blackness. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Greetings, friends, comrades, family, the inquisitive onlookers, and our beloved viewers. Welcome, welcome, and welcome to Our Story Network. We thank you for being with us this evening, and we trust you will take something of value away with you this evening. That is the aim and goal of Our Story Network, the network that leads the pack in modern day communications. With that being said, I want to take this opportunity to address the Alton Sterling case as it refers to every black person in America. After viewing the newly released footage of the murder of Alton Sterling, I have concluded this. <clears throat> On March 30th, 2018, Baton Rouge uh, Police Chief Murphy Paul, a black man, took all of 25 minutes to announce the official report of the investigation of Alton Sterling the young black man killed by Baton Rouge police officers because they feared for their lives. In the report, several videos were released revealing in real time events as they happened. Chief Murphy Paul disclosed after trying to reassure both the black community and the police officers he has under his command that he will watch the backs of both groups. It was obvious the duty before the police chief was difficult and unpleasant, but it had to be done if black people in America were to have any faith in the justice system, according to Chief Paul. Chief Paul's attempt to satisfy both parties was reminiscent of King Solomon's charge when King Solomon was called to render justice for two women who claimed the baby in question belonged to each. King Solomon proclaimed both women had legitimate claims to the child. Therefore, the king's proclamation was to cut the baby in half. Upon hearing this, the real mother asked for the child's life to be spared. The woman proclaimed, give the child to her. After hearing this, the king proclaimed, only a mother would sacrifice her own claim to keep the child alive. He therefore gave the child to the woman who was willing to give up her claim in hopes of keeping the child alive. This is how I see Chief Paul's decision to fire one and suspend the other police officer in this investigation. Chief Paul is trying to split the baby in half in hopes everyone will be satisfied. Unfortunately, I cannot see the injustice of America and more importantly, the hate the white race has inflicted upon the black race as being forgiven so easily. Even King Solomon would have to condemn premeditated murder. The footage of the body cameras and the dashboard cameras makes no mistake on the real cause of Alton Sterling's death. Officer Blaine Samani uh, planned to kill Alton Sterling from the very beginning. The footage shows, as Blaine told Alton Sterling many times, he was going to shoot him in the head if he did not stop resisting. Alton Sterling was not resisting. Understand, resisting arrest is one of the accepted defenses for police killing a black suspect. Blaine wanted to kill Alton Sterling or any other black person who happened to fit the perfect situation that would grant Officer Blaine impunity. The entire footage is proof positive that both Officer Blaine and Howie Lake II were both guilty of various charges that would demand immediate firing from their positions. Furthermore, 
from the footage released by Chief Paul, the U.S. Department of Justice should have filed charges against both officers. Alton Sterling's civil rights were definitely violated. Republicans own Jeff Landry, the Attorney General of Louisiana, refused to indict the police officers. The evidence is clear. Blaine Salamani, uh, execution of Alton Sterling was premeditated and should have been prosecuted as a hate crime. And Howie Lake II is an accomplice to murder and refusal to stand in and stand up for the rights of citizens when a police officer is out of control should be punishable by immediate dismissal. Additionally, Howie Lake II refused medical attention to Alton Sterling. The Baton Rouge police are known for ill will and police brutality to the black community. Premeditated murder is nothing new to the black Baton Rouge Police Department. But what is overlooked by many blacks is the fault that the murdering of black life is rooted in the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. For a more detailed account of how and why the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is responsible, get my new book, Our Story, The, La the Original Holocaust, now available at Community Book Center, 2523 Bayou Road, Wayne's World and Sons, 2255 St. Claude Avenue, and on the West Bank at Educa Educator's Delight, 3501 Holiday Drive, Suite 405. You can also order the book online by sending an email to wcjohnson76 at yahoo.com and state you are interested in the book. You will receive an email invoice from PayPal. Make your payments online and the book will be sent to you. Thank you for the continued support and let me know what you think of the book. Tonight, we are going to examine another flaw in the fabric of the American frontier, education for the black children of New Orleans. Before I introduce our guests, I want to be very empathetic about the treatment black people receive in America and especially in New Orleans. We have black folks who are willing to step out in front of many issues and champion the ills and problems black people face today, especially in New Orleans. Many of you just allow the champions of your causes to dangle in the wind, meaning when these champions place their lives and their livelihoods in danger, many times you, the black public, refuse to raise one hand of help and assist to move the issue to the next level, but complain when things go wrong for you. Don't do this to our guest tonight. Tonight, we are talking about our children and their ability to receive a quality education. Be mindful, be energetic, but by all means be supportive with your time and commitments moving the black agenda forward. With that, I want to introduce the uh, New Orleans for Children's Legal Defense Fund which came out of a group of citizens who formed to be able to attack the problems that our children are facing in school and specifically with Act 91. We have with us this evening Sister Alicia who is spearheading the uh, move along with State Representative from District 97, Dr. Joseph Bowie who was scheduled to be with us this evening but has gotten tied up with legislative business in Baton Rouge. So with that, I want to introduce our guest, Sister Alicia Plummer, and I want to thank her for taking the time to be with us and letting our viewers know exactly what is happening 
on our streets and highways and byways here in New Orleans. Sister Alicia, thank you for being here and enlighten our audience as to what the New Orleans for Children Legal uh, Fund is, Defense Fund is, why it is, and why they should be a part of it. Well, um, thank you for having me, uh, Mr. Johnson. You know it's, it's a pleasure and also an honor to be here to be able to talk to the uh, community and to yourself to share what's going on, to complain about what's going on, to strategize to make things better for our community. As you said, a group of us citizens um, who have been fed up with what's going on with our children in the education system. When Dr. Bowie first ran for office, we knew he was going to be the representative for District 97. But we had so many wrongs and ills, especially in our education system. We put a mandate on Dr. Bowie, although you're going to be representing District 97. We need you for all of us and for mm. all of our children. We gave him the mandate to fight to bring our <clears throat> public schools back. As everybody knows, I'm a proud Ron Eagle mm. from 35. Ron Eagle soar. We soar high. But this is not just a 35 thing. This is about all of our children in public school. The ones who used to go to Clark, Cohen, Booker Washington, Nichols, that's now on Frederick Douglass, uh, Clark, all these, Forshe, all these schools no longer exist. And we have um, a group of Democrats, our New Orleans delegation, who voted against our children. And to me, these ch the charter system is a Republican agenda, mm -hmm. slash Betsy DuVos, okay? She's pushing the charter agenda. Well, a lot of us, you know, have been trying to fight to, for our schools, first off, not to be taken away from us, but then once we had Act 91, we started delving into the situation. And a lot of us do feel that Act 91 is unconstitutional. Act 91 was um, authored by State Senator Karen Carter-Peterson, who's also the Democratic uh, chair of the state of Louisiana, okay? Act 91 takes away all the power and control from our elected school board. That's unconstitutional because we did not vote mm -hmm. to allow um, a, a politically appointed advisory commission to represent us and run our schools, okay? It only applies to Orleans Parish, right. okay? That's unconstitutional, <clears throat> okay? And they've never said, we've never said that um, as a body, state of Louisiana, we want charter schools to be, represent us as public schools for the state of Louisiana. There's never been a constitutional amendment to do these things, but yet they passed this legislation. And the only way that the legislation is going to be gone is we have to do a legal challenge. So we put a burden on Dr. Bowie, but while we burden Dr. Bowie with trying to fight to get our schools back, he did some research. And in that research, he found where the state of Louisiana sponsored an experiment. Hmm. Now, when I say experiment, think Tuskegee. An experiment on our children without parental consent and while, without parental knowledge. That's going on now. There's no data to say what's going on. There's no data to say how the experiment is going. There's no data to say that how they're going to operate and, and do the experiment. But it is, it is surely going on with our children without our consent or knowledge. So it was an experiment that was it continues going to be on an experiment. Without, yes. out, without oversight. Right. Continues to be an experiment. And everybody was shocked. And uh, when Dr. Bowie found this out, so people are asking, you know, well, what do you all mean? You all keep talking about it. You, you, what are you all talking about? Could you explain to us? So we've asked Dr. Bowie to be able to do this. We have a forum, a meeting plan, so that Dr. Bowie can come and explain to parents, to pastors, to just the general public, to come and understand what he's talking about when, he's, when he talks about the experiment that he has discovered that's been going on with our children and also to explain Act 91. Now, Dr. Bowie has also um, engaged uh, Pastor Fred Luter, Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, and Reverend Willie Calhoun. 
because they know that in order for us to be able to help us, we have to engage the preachers. Just like in the old days, the preachers were very, very beneficial in the movement, so we have to be able to engage the preachers so that they can understand what's been done to our children and they can help with this movement so that we can get some change done. Um, we're gonna have a meeting on tomorrow, April 12th, 6.30 to 8 o'clock at Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, 2515 Franklin Avenue. And we'll have Dr. Bowie to explain the experiment and also explain the um, Act 91. We're gonna have Reverend um, Luda and Calhoun to engage the preachers, the pastors, to get them involved in the movement. And also we're gonna have uh, students so they can tell you about what's going on, parents and, and education advocates to tell you what's going on. We're gonna discuss the transportation problems. We're gonna discuss the One App problem, which is a sham. And we're also going to discuss uh, our strategies. And that brings in the, um, the New Orleans for Children Legal Defense Fund. Mm. And the New Orleans for Children Legal Defense Fund is, again, um, done by a group of citizens who are fed up. And we need to help our children. And the only way we're going to make changes, we have to challenge Act 91 and also this experiment. What do I mean when I say challenge it? We're going to have to do a legal challenge. And in order for us to do that, we're going to have to raise monies for attorneys to bring this challenge to the state. And you know, it's unfortunate that fighting costs money these days, but um, the only way that we can wage a legal fight is for us to be able to pay attorneys to right. go out here and represent us. Right. In our interests. Right. We definitely, you know, would, would love for some attorneys to do some pro bono work, you know, help us with this, this fight because this is unconstitutional what they're doing to our children. And only Orleans Parish. Now the question is why only Orleans Parish? And we're on the cusp of Orleans Parish being 100% charter. Hmm. That's a Republican agenda. Yes. And this is going to be the only parish in the nation that's only parish, only county, school board, school district in the nation that's going to be 100% charter. Now, like I said, I, I went to 35, and we're fighting tooth and nail. We're the last one so far. And like, it's not a, a, just a 35 fight. This is a fight for all our children, bring all our schools back. So now that, in hindsight, I'll say, that we realize that this is a Republican agenda, where is Karen Carter Peterson sitting now that she has really forced this down our throat several years ago? We have seen the outcome and it has not been good for us. No, and, and, and on that note, I don't want to interrupt you, but on that note, study after study after study, report after report after report, the Lens, the Advocate, the Times Picayune, NPR, uh, the Washington Journal, New York Times, all these people have, and ProPublica, all these people have uh, done studies and done reports to say that this experiment, this reform, this charter movement, this charter reform is a failure. So, so where is Karen Carter-Peterson on this issue now? She's still on it, not, and not just Karen Carter-Peterson. We have the entire New Orleans delegation except for Dr. Bowie, that's, that, well, that ponied up and voted for it, and that are still supporting it. Wow, so what's the Every Bishop last and, one of them. Um, Senator Peterson, her cousin, Senator J.P. Morrell, Morrell yeah. um, Senator uh, Troy Carter, Senator Wesley Bishop, State Representative John Bagnaris, State Representative um, Gary Carter, uh, who am I missing? State Representative uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Harris, everybody, Helena Moreno. Mm. Uh, so everybody in the Orleans delegation voted for this. Yes. Uh, can City Council help in any way? I think the City Council has a duty with the bully pulpit. They may not have direct control or authority, but they, but they have the, the, the bully pulpit. They can get on it, they, they can get involved. They really can. So I assume the new mayor should be able to get involved as well. She, all the, all, every last one of them. Mm -hmm. Every last one of them. Mm -hmm. 
We've put on the um, phone number if you'd like to get in on the conversation with questions or comments. Uh, we invite you at this time to. The number is on the, the air, so uh, chime in if you wish. Now, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I've worked in trying to bring change to the school board way back in the 80s and early 90s, and I know then it was like running your head up against a brick wall. Now that we have at least one legislator that's working with us, what is the light, or first of all I should ask, is there light at the end of the tunnel and what is that light looking like? The light at the end of the tunnel is the legal challenge. Mm. And it is evident, we've, we've spoken to so many people, and even the <clears> powers that be, they were fearful when Dr. Bush found out about the experiment, number one. Even the powers that be, they know that this is wrong. So the light at the end of the tunnel is only going to be opened by the legal challenge. And, and part of that legal challenge, I would assume, is the fact that they've been conducting an experiment without notifying us, first of all. Without notifying us. Secondly, getting permission and approval no from permission, parents. No consent. So this is more like the old uh, 1930s, 1940s Hitler move in, in Nazi Germany. That's mm -hmm, basically what mm -hmm. this is. Absolutely. And for those who don't know that, as I can say, the easiest way people know the Tuskegee experiment. experiment. Yes, exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's unfortunate that um, we allow these things to happen. And I say we because I know I, I do everything I can to turn things around. But we as a whole, as black people, if it doesn't affect us directly, then we have no concern, no interest. We have, no, we have nothing to, to do with it. But this is the thing, it is, it is affecting us. Yeah. Uh, because the crime. Yes. The crime is through the roof. We didn't have the, the um, juvenile delinquency. We didn't have the, the young crime, uh, well, crime committed by youth like we have now. Okay. People always bring up the fact, oh, but the old school board was horrible, this, that, and the other. There was some corruption, of course. But the corruption that's going on now can't compare to what it was then. To what it was. The failures of the <clears throat> school, the children, can't compare to what it was. And I always give the analogy, um, we have so many failures with the school system, uh, with the grades and stuff, because we had educators back then, trained educators, who went to school to be teachers, who were certified and qualified, educated, graduated from a university in education trained to teach our children. What you have now with the Teach for America um, teachers, you will have a ballet dancer, someone who went to school to learn how to be a ballet dancer. Hmm. And that person just want to get their, their, their debt paid in two years. You have a ballet dancer standing in front of our children trying to teach them the core subjects. We wonder why Johnny can't read. Johnny can't read because John is not getting educated right. from, ed from an educator. Yeah, yeah. And then we have the transportation. Our yes. kids still getting up in the morning, 4, 4.30 in the morning, be at a, a dark, desolate bus stop at 5.45, 5.30 in the morning to travel. Two and a half hours, cross town to another failing school instead of having an opportunity to walk down the street to a, a failing school. And then they wonder by the time Johnny get to school, he's hungry, he's tired, he's sleepy. So again, Johnny can't read. Mm. It's devastating to our children. So transportation is going to be a part of this meeting tomorrow? Transportation is going to be a part of the meeting because what, um, it's going to be exposed the amount of money that they're paying for transportation. We already know that some um, schools like the Einstein, Einstein School, uh, they just had a court battle because they were not providing transportation to those children. And by law, they're supposed to provide transportation. You had parents who didn't know what to do. They had to leave their jobs and go, you know, try to get it to the school. And it's not like they have to walk to the school. Parents who don't have transportation, as you, and you know how poor people in this city, they don't have transportation. Right. So you have a mother who has three children, and, and, and because of the, the, the sham of a one-app system, 
that mother may have three children in three different schools. So if there's no transportation, she has to leave work, get on a bus to go to where that child is to get that child. The possibility of losing a job, and if she's constantly paying for transportation for herself on the bus, that takes money and resources away from the family. That shouldn't be. We didn't have that when we went to school. We did not have those issues. We had neighborhood schools where you can walk to the school. Choice was when we, what we had before. They're using this narrative to talk about, oh, well, with the reform, you have choice. I always ask, whenever I've gone before the Bessie, whenever I've gone before the Orleans Parish School Board, I ask the question, show me one parent who chooses to put their child on a 530 in the corner morning bus, yeah. And ship them to a school across two and a half town. hours away across yeah. town. Show me, just show me one. Yeah. So, will we get information about the One App and revelations about the One App? Well, I, I, I'm sure there's going to be people in the audience who's going to be able to give us the revelations about the One App. Mm. Mm. Now, your group. I understand you guys have been meeting on a regular basis and you've done stellar work as far as getting um, the documentation and information together. Now we're in a phase, uh, I would assume, of the um, dispensing the information and distributing it yes. so the people will know. Yes. That, that's what tomorrow's going to be about. Tomorrow night is going to be about information, getting it out and we're going to end with the strategies. And like I said, the ultimate strategy is we need to raise the funds for the legal challenge. And that's what um, our main thing is going to be after that. Raise the um, monies to pay attorneys to fight for our children. Now, on this, um, on this legal defense fund, we have got to communicate to our people the need to raise this money so that we can have an opportunity to fight this in court. Mm -hmm. And from all indicators that I have seen, if it's not an open and shut case, it ought to be something close to it. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. But like I said, in, all, in order for us to change that um, unconstitutional uh, Act 91, you have to bring a legal challenge, and that's, that's what we plan to do. And we know that there are people who want to be involved. It's, it's, now, we're asking for the thousands and stuff like that because we're going to need that kind of money. But we're also asking for anything. You know, parents who want to get involved, they got a dollar, they got two dollars, give us five dollars. You know, everything counts with this legal defense fund because we know it may be a long, um, arduous task, you know, with filing um, briefs and stuff like that. But we are accepting all denominations to be able to fight for our children. And our children are worth it. You know, I, I have to ask this question because I, I've been organizing and working in the community here in New Orleans for a long time. And I have to ask the question, what is it going to take for our people to understand the seriousness and the value of financing a legal fight for our children. I don't know. I, I really don't know what it's going to take, but um, we're going to be knocking doors. We're going to be making phone calls. We want to see just how serious the people are about having sympathy and having um, uh, uh, love and loyalty to our children. And, and if you really care, it's time to put up. Yeah. It's yeah. going to be time to put up. Well, I certainly, um, I believe that it is. I think it's really long way, overdue, yeah, way past to be that. honest with you. It's we past agree. that. We agree. Yeah. So um, let us talk more about uh, the work that Dr. Bowie has been doing. Um, I know that he was trying to get other legislators to uh, work along with him, and I think he's been having a hard time with that, hasn't he? Yeah, uh, he has, and if there's been some snippets of some um, things that's been going on in the uh, legislature, would he truly, he's battling other um, legislators when he's bringing the information to them. 
he was trying to explain what's going on with our children and, to, and, and what's going on, what he see was happening with the experiment, how the experiment is um, unfair and the experiment is biased because it is about our children. And how we see the effects of the experiment is, and the, the, the effects of the experiment, like I said, you know, crime is through the roof. Our children are not being educated. It's a pipeline to prison uh, system with the charters. Discipline is horrible. They're not being educated. They don't have opportunities. And their parents don't have opportunities. We have children who there's no longer um, the trade schools giving them opportunity to learn a trade to be able to go uh, out into the workforce. Those opportunities are not available for them. And children are frustrated when they can't catch on. When Johnny can't read, then Johnny gets to be rambunctious. When Johnny can't, you know, uh, succeed, and sometimes it is not Johnny's fault, you know, then you see problems. Nobody's there to help Johnny get through with the system. Because like, again, once again, you don't have educators. For the most part, you don't have qualified, educated educators teaching our children. We don't have people from our community. Back mm. when we went to school, teachers lived in the neighborhood. The cafeteria lady lived in the neighborhood. The janitor lived in the neighborhood. My daughter, when my daughter started school, she went to France school. France had a, a building for the janitor. The janitor lived in that house. I had no worries. I would drop my baby off. Miss Joseph was the janitor over there. She was a head custodian. And when I let her out the door, I had no concerns. I knew Miss um, Joseph was going to take care of my baby. We had people from the neighborhood. Community was in the schools. You don't have that now. And it makes a big difference, too. It makes a big difference. You know, the fact that we don't have people from our community interacting with our children mm -hmm. um, it is, a, is a serious problem that I don't think enough of us understand or are willing to admit to. And they're running, you know, they're no longer public schools because we don't have access into the schools. Right. You know, you right. can't just go to the schools anymore. They are private corporations and those corporations own those buildings. So a mother can't just show up at the school. A, a father can't just show up at the school. They have to make appointments to go into the school. You can't just go in like you used to. Go to the office, get permission to go talk to the teacher or something like that. Can't do that. You know, you, you, you just made a big point. Um, I remember, who, 30 years ago, there was this uh, talk about the future mm -hmm. and what our communities and, and lifestyles were going to be like. One of the things that came up was the fact that education was going to be placed in the hands of corporations and they were going to educate our children. And they pitched it to us then as it being a good thing. 30 years forward, fast forward 30 years where we are today, we see that corporations are only interested in bodies that are generating dollars for them. I've often said education in New Orleans is not about learning. Education in New Orleans is about the dollars. And that's exactly what it is. It's about the dollars. And to give you an example, uh, the children start school August to, to, to October. Okay, so they're counting the seats. They may have some children that's disruptive in the system coming in. And that child sits till the money is counted by October 1 or October 10, whatever that, did, whatever that deadline is. After that, they start throwing them out, throwing them out. They, they put them out, because they've banked the money already. Yeah. So yeah. our children are off on the streets. They, whatever alternative they have, God knows. But it's a money thing. Now you went, going back to something you said about the schools or prison to pipeline, 
or pipeline to prisons, rather, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, is very true. Mm -hmm. And then when we, as black adults, allow our children to be handcuffed and arrested in school. In school. Without calling the parent for violations that they don't even understand. Right. The one that got me, I heard about this week, I think it was on your y'all show on Monday, that a, a five-year-old brought the Tums, the roll of Tums to school. Roll of Tums to school. He thought it was candy. Yes. He was arrested. Right. A five-year-old, seven-year-old arrested for bringing Tums. I remember when we were children, we thought x lax was candy. You know? I, I want to know what they're charging these children I, with. I, that's a good one. And why that's is it only one. happening in black schools? Well, why is charter schools only, only operating in black schools? <laughs> in black <Yeah>. schools. <laughs> you know, Ch Chicago, Detroit, all your major black um, uh, populous urban areas. Yes. Yeah. Is, is where the charter. Chalmet is right next door. Chalmet doesn't have charters. And yet the superintendent that's over all these parish schools came from Chalmet. <laughs> and he's pushing 100% charter in all these parish. Well, if charter wasn't good enough for those, for those kids down in Chalmet, why we have to have them? Well, there, no, this, this is the reason why we have to have them because for the most part, people do not stay informed about what's going on, and then they don't get upset to the point where they're pressuring someone to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Because we're black, for some reason, many of us have the thoughts and feelings that we don't have the privilege to say anything, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or to complain, mm -hmm. or to speak up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And on that point, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's the parents, it's the parents. Yes, parents do have their responsibility. But I feel from my heart, a lot of parents don't even know that they can fight and how to fight. They don't know. They complain all the time about one app. All, nobody's happy about one app, okay? Because the so-called good schools, they don't participate in one app. Lush is not in one app. Ben Franklin's not in one app. Lake Forest Charter, which I call a black lusher, they're not in one app. Mm. Okay, so the parents really don't know. And then when you have a parent, once again, has three children that go to three different schools, they don't know how to fight. They don't even know that they can fight. They just don't know. And then they're busy. They're working two and three jobs. Yeah. Then they say, well, they don't participate in um, the Parent Teacher Association, a PTO, what they call it now. They're working. How, they're working, and not only that, when PTO was to the, at the school right around the corner, I could walk. Right. But now I don't have transportation to get to that school, and then my other child is in another school, then my third child is in the third school. So all that is by design. Yes, definitely. It's by design. Definitely. Then um, hopefully people will come out tomorrow and it starts at 6 o'clock? 6 o'clock? 6.30. 6.30. 6.30, Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, 2515 Franklin Avenue. Um, and it's going to be a lot of information uh, for, for them to get. It's going to be inf you know, informative for them. They will know what's going on in our school system. They don't have to worry about the rumors with the hearing. You're going to get the information. I want to ask uh, a, a, an obvious question, I guess. For me, it's obvious. Will tomorrow's meeting put pressure on the clergy in this city? Well, that is the main reason why this meeting um, started. Because um, Reverend Calhoun, uh, Pastor Luther, and State Representative Dr. Bowie They've recognized the fact that in order for us to get out, the information to get out, we have to bring the preachers, and the preachers have to step in to help their parishioners, their congregants, to get this information out 
so we can make some changes. They have to step up. The preachers have to step up and do something, just like they did in the civil rights movement. I think it was last week we celebrated 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. My question was, where is the church today? Now, when we look at the historical accountings of what happened during his life and time, the church got a lot of credit for a lot of things that happened. Mm -hmm. So, where are they today, and when did they, and why did they abandon us? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I was young in the in the '60s, you know, baby. Uh, but what I do know now is we've got to engage them like they were engaged then. back in the, in the 60s. We have to educate them. They have to know what's going on in our school system because a lot of them supported these legislators yes. that are doing this to our children. A so, lot of them supported Act 91. Exactly. So now what we're trying to do is inform them of what the real deal is to get them engaged, to get their members engaged, and to be able to stand up and fight for our children. We have to. We cannot continue to let this happen. We cannot continue to let our children go to jail because we know that's where the new money is. We, we cannot afford to do that. We have to save our community. We have to save our children. We have to educate our children. And the only way we're going to be able to do that, we have to right the wrongs that's been going on. Hmm. Well, I'm going to be looking cautiously at the clergy to see where they're going to end up mm -hmm. on this issue and how much work they're actually going to put into this. Because my understanding is you have a minister, a rabbi, an imam, who already has an organized structure in place. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they using their structure to make things better for us in this city? And we know quite a few of the preachers bring in politicians when they're running mm -hmm and suggest that we vote for them. Well, good thing you said that. That's what we want to do. We want to be able to come into the churches uh, like the politicians do. Give us five minutes, give us three minutes to just give you a synopsis of what's going on and how we need your help. Mm -hmm. Let us come like the politicians. Let us stand up and wave and tell, let everybody know what we're here for what we're about, what the struggle is, and how we can um, change things. That's what we want to do. We want to be able to go into the churches and educate. Educate the pastors, educate the priests, educate all those um, uh, religious sects that you're talking about to, so that they can educate their um, flock. members. Yeah, their, their flock, flock. Their flock, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so invite us in so we can also. But come to the meeting tomorrow. The meeting is open for the, pre the preachers, the pastors, all of them. It's also open for the public to come and find out what's going on and also be able to um, strategize how we're going to make change. Well, I'm going to certainly be there tomorrow, and I'm going to watch and listen. And knowing me, I'll probably get up and have something to say as well. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm curious as to what they're really going to do and to see if they're going to get behind Dr. Bowie. And our children. And our children and, and our support children. this man. That's right. And our children. That's right. That's right. You know, uh, I've known Doc a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I admire this man because as well educated as he is, mm -hmm. he was never too educated to take his jacket off, roll his sleeves up, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and get to work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
and sometimes that work meant that we had to, we had to get rough mm -hmm. with some people. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, right after Katrina, he had a big rally on Suno's campus. Mm -hmm. And um, it was about the state not coming in with the resources to help rebuild Suno. In fact, they left the buildings that had been flooded just sitting there. Yes. And I was among a group that opened up those buildings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Doc had no problem with what we did. And believe it or not, once we opened up the education building, the state came in after that and they started cleaning the buildings <laughs> out. But I went in with a team of folks yeah. and we pulled all that stuff that had mm -hmm. been underwater and submerged and brought it outside mm -hmm. and put it on the walkways and the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after seeing that, I guess the state decided they better come and do something because they oh. made them look terrible, I guess. But um, Doc has a long history in this city. Yes, yes for actually representing people. Representing people, fighting for the people. He is truly a civil servant. He is truly the people's person. Yeah. Because yeah. he's really doing it. He's a long read out there from Orleans Parish. Yeah. That's yeah. fighting for our children. You know, you said civil servant, and that, that is true. He is not a politician. Right. He is a, a civil, civil servant. servant. Absolutely, he is. <laughs> before, before we go, can I leave my information? You know, please, do, people, please do, please um, do. You can contact me at 504-458-5809 um, to get information about the Legal Defense Fund. And um, any all inf other information, if you need us to come out to your church or to your organization to be able to tell you uh, the information so that you can get on board, please call me, text me. Um, so we can get all the help we need for our children. And if you miss that, my number is up there. If you call me, I will put you in touch with uh, this good sister here. And um, we'll, we'll refer all the calls to her and, and Dr. Bowie so that we can start this train moving down the track mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that we're able to start showing our children right. that we're serious about being concerned about our children. Right, absolutely. Telling you. Before we get out of here, I want to say one more time, uh, just remind the listeners that uh, my book, Our Story, the original Holocaust, is available at the Community Book Center which is at, located at 22, 25, I believe. And um, it's also at um, uh, uh, Wayne's World and Sons on St. Claude Avenue, as well as uh, Educator's Delight over on the West Bank. So keep it in mind, and um, I think you'll get a lot of answers to things that we're having to deal with right here and now. That's um, the Community Book Center, 2523 Bayou Road, Wayne's World, 2255 St. Claude Avenue, and Educator's Delight which is 3501 Holiday Drive, Suite 405. Do you have any parting words for us before we get out of here? Once again, um, our children need your help. Dr. Bowie needs the help. And uh, we need you out there tomorrow to get the information. And that's um, tomorrow, April 12th, Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, 2515 Franklin Avenue, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Please come. Be prepared to listen, ask questions, and also um, help us start this Legal Defense Fund, the New Orleans for Children Legal Defense Fund, to fight this um, challenge. And with that, stay strong, 
stay committed, but by all means, stay involved, brothers and sisters. Till we meet again, Yohuro Susa Ungawa. Brainstorms are designed to celebrate our rain. Yeah, when you put it in perspective, the collective, monuments erected, continents affected, presidents elected, ancestors making moves with the music we've been blessed with. We use it to keep communities connected through harmonies, a harmony is collected. Reaping the fruits our foremothers invested Lift every voice till freedom has been invested uh, come on, yeah Lift every voice till freedom has been invested Come on, listen Lift every voice till freedom has been invested Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.